start and hopefully some more people uh, will be joining in. <clears throat> so the first thing is um, approval of the August 5th meeting minutes. All in favor of approving them? Opposed? Abstain? Okay, the meeting minutes are approved. Uh, CJ, is there anybody here for public comment? I'm not seeing anyone in the waiting room. Okay. Then we'll move on to the big topic of the day, saving Bell Station. That's going to be an uphill battle. Um, Peter Mantius wrote an article that said, and he interviewed some nice egg people, and they said they're going ahead with the auction, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I don't think that means we should we should give up yet. So, so recap, uh, Tom, just briefly where things stand with the town board and the timing and things like that. Um, I'm happy to do that. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So anyway, as you know, we, we drafted something within the CAC and then that um, went to CJ and a couple of other people um, had some input and it made its way um, eventually to the town board. And um, it seems like a week from yesterday, so on the 8th of September, um, they're going to have a special meeting and they are going to um, vote on moving it forward. Just, just correct me if I'm wrong, Andra or CJ. Um, and then meanwhile, uh, CJ's reached out to um, the committee on the power plant future and they um, have given a thumbs up and also um, Rec and Trails Committee. And I believe they have all uh, ag agreed as a committee to sign on. And so those other entities are going to be mentioned along with the CAC in this letter from the town that would go to um, Senator Helming and also I believe Anna Kellis, right? And a number of other people. And a, a lot of other people will be copied on that uh, is my understanding. Hey, Carrie, I got a question for you. And I, I don't know why it has taken me this long to ask about this, but one thing that has never been mentioned in any of the myriad of letters supporting Bell Station um, that is really important, I think, to include is the connection with the Blue Way Trail, which is, you know, the water component of the Waterfront Trail. Nobody's talking about it. And, you know, I think one of the reasons why that site was even being, you know, one of the one of the really nice things about it for first, if it were to be a state forest or a DC property is that there's a flat accessible landing there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't know if maybe somebody has, a, you know, some insight that I just completely missed. Um, or CJ, if you've heard this in your discussions with other people. It's a really great point. Uh, no, but if the, um, you know, I don't know if the legislature's uh, resolution addressed it. Uh, that's a good question since it is a, it's sort of a county project, but mm -hmm. I'm certainly happy to um, mention that to them to reach, reach out to Nick Hamholt. He's a tourism director for county. Uh, and so can just mention that to send it to that and Tompkins County Parks and Trails Network as well. Uh, I'm just wondering, if, well. in addition to CCing all of these people on it, I mean, uh, you know, urge them to write their, their own letter, but also um, mention it in the letter that we drafted, or has that gone out already? No, it hasn't gone out. Um, could that be added? To well, the it's it's gone it's gone to the the town board, but we can still 
No, not yet. Um, the, oh, it hasn't oh. gone to the town board because uh, we're anticipating CAC will make the final edits tonight to then okay. go to town council and the town board as soon as you're done, basically, tonight. That will go. Okay. I'll, I'll be sending it out. So um, this is the opportunity to add any additional language. So um, just Carrie, if you wanted to do like a screen share thingy, uh, like a live edit or something right. of the draft. I'd be happy to do that. I'm I'm hoping that the draft is the still the August 25th one or has it, there been a change? Um, Cause that's the one that we sent. Um, I can pull that up. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember because I've only seen a map of the stops on the Blue Way Trail um, once, but it's, it's, there is one down in Stewart Park um, on the waterfront trail itself. And I think that there's a stop at Myers and then I'm assuming there, there will be another stop at Cayuga Cliffs, but there's a, you know, it's five miles of shoreline between Cayuga Cliffs and and Bell Station. So it would be a perfect, you know, a perfect spot either transiting across the lake diagonally from Taganic, because I think that's also on it, or just working one's way up the um, up the east shore. Well, the Cayuga Cliffs, does that have waterfront that's accessible? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't look like it's currently on the Blue Way Trail from the map that I can see on the website for it. I think uh, Finger Lakes Land Trust is planning to get it onto the Blue Way Trail as, as a new stop. Oh, okay. So it's not on there. Uh, not yet. So yep, they, for outcome. Yeah, they just uh, acquired the property. So or yeah, it was too new. It was too new. So there, I mean, there's, there's access from the water, but you just, the thing about that preserve is that you can't get from below to above. Right. That's, that's the, the access issue, but the water, you know, the, the shoreline for certain is, uh, is going to be part of it. So how do we, how would we want to say this? And then we can kind of get a sense of whether everybody's in agreement it's along the lines of, you know, Bell Station is, is it slated to be on the blue um, trail? No. no, I mean, it can't be on the Blue Way Trail if it's owned by NYSEG, but it would be, I would say, a, an extremely appealing stop on the Blue Way Trail mm -hmm. if it were public land. Okay, um, so maybe we should put this in a different section. Um, Maybe here. Do you go like Blue Way tra Trail? How about that? Yeah, and you could say something like um, enhancing enhancing access um, both by water and by land to this extremely valuable conservation resource, something like that. Uh, and blue A is uh, one word. Yeah. Uh, is it capital W? Uh, no. Okay, thanks, CJ. Okay, so this is the part that we would add. Um, now, just highlight that for a second so everybody can see that. Is <laughs> maybe we could say more than just appealing, uh, given the second clause there, which says, uh, I don't know, appealing and important or something. Or how about a, yeah, how about a crucial connection node to yeah, Cuba Lake? That's good. Just borrowing from my CFA language here. That's good. Would be, uh, also be a crucial connection to uh, Cayuga Lake 
as as part of the Blue Way Trail. Right. Enhancing access by both water and land to this valuable conservation resource. I think that yeah. sounds great. That's okay. Awesome. Good. Good. So do we do we need a thumbs up on, on that or I like it. I think, I think it sounds good. Okay. Yeah, it looks fine to me. Yeah. Great. Any other I'm going to save this as today's date, uh, but then we'll we'll lose. Actually, we'll lose it um, if there's anything else people want to change. Um, we can do that. And um, my main concern whole... is getting it out as quickly as possible because the auction is <laughs> is coming, and you know, nice egg is resisting. So I think we should get it going quickly and not spend. It's, it's already been through a lot of rounds of edits and I think it looks pretty good. Well, well, we'll send it out tonight for sure, right? This is it. Well, uh, it, is that the timetable? Yeah, so let me just um, hold up and uh, give you the timetable on this. Um, and I'm also happy to add um, some of the language. I thought um, Liz Thomas did a nice job with the you know, Watershed in your Municipal Organization letter, uh, which does list a number of bullet points included in the harmful algal bloom. Uh, plan for Cuga Lake, as well as there are some other bullet points as well. So um, if you'd like, I'm happy to just add that in on CAC's behalf. Um, so tonight, uh, uh, when you get this to where you want it, um, I will send this to the town council who is going to edit this and then turn it around to the town board. Uh, for their review and they are going to be they set up a special meeting basically as soon as I could as far as I understand I mean Andre could probably speak to that a little better but um, uh, this was when town clerk was uh, available to set a night meeting and uh, that's Wednesday uh, this coming Wednesday the 8th uh, so they'll be uh, presumably passing a motion endorsing CAC to send this letter so remember like we did with the orchards uh, where we uh, put it on town letterhead and we made sure that uh, hard copies and email copies went out to everyone on the list. That's exactly what will be happening with this. So it'll be sim very similar to that process. So that's a week from today. Or uh, yesterday. And this letter is going to everyone on the CC list. Well. <clears throat> so Carl Taylor will see it. Not just mediated through Senator Honey. Uh, yeah, Carl Taylor is copied on the list. One of the many, there's like a whole mess of people that are CC'd on it. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I want to need to make sure that NYSEG sees it and that it's not going to everybody but NYSEG. Yeah. Uh, well, he's currently, I can show you the letter the way it stands now. Um, so he's here. That's what I want to make sure. Um, and there's also um, a couple others, um, uh, Robin, as well. Uh, so it'll also go to Craig Miller, the state manager of public affairs for NYSEG, as well as Gavin Mosley, program manager for government and community relations for NYSEG as well. Should we put those on there, CJ? Yeah, I'm going to bring, I'm going to bring all these extra contacts on there. I mean, you can put them in if you, if you want to, but I was just going to do that kind Miller. of, um, the, that kind of copy editing for you here. Okay. All right. So, um, do you, and is everybody fine with CJ just okay. adding in about Habs? Um, yeah, I'm happy to um, put those in the list. That would that's be fine great. with me. Gavin Miller, and then I there, I missed one. Oh no! Hold on a second here. Let me. So um, CJ, I, I just want to double check. Did you say that you are going to reach out either by email or phone to the director or whatever it is of the waterfront trail, or I could do that to make sure uh, that we're coordinating and they've got all the talking points too? Uh, yeah, so um, Darby Kiley and Scott Doyle at the county have been coordinating uh, the county's letter, and so I'll make sure that Nick Hemholds, uh, who's also in county planning, is looped into that as well, because Parks and Trails uh, Network also may want to send uh, a letter as well. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, no worries. If you 
I'd also like to reach out. And I'm sure that's fine. The more voices, the better, I think. Yeah, well, I might, I might contact Rick Manning in any case, because I, I think from the, you know, from sort of the popular side of it, and he's connected with a lot of, you know, a lot of people who are, have played a big role in the Waterfront Trail. So it's just more letters also, you know, whether it's from the, you know, the, the organization or it's from concerned citizens, just want to light a fire under everybody that's possible. Um, what about the Public Service Commission? I don't see a contact on this list for them. Um, it seems yes. like they're the only ones with the authority to approve or cancel the auction. And it, it may be the case that the auction must happen. This is a big, you know, regulated industry. They may have no choice but to do auctions and put out everything for bid. They may not be able to award contracts and grants or whatever they want. So maybe they have to auction it off. And that's fine. But if there's somebody with the authority to cancel the auction, that is maybe where the pressure should be applied. And should it, be, should it be a different letter to PSC than to everybody else too? I mean, that's, yeah, that was my thought also, given how strident the NYSEG comms person was to um, to Peter Mantius when he was interviewing that person for his article. I mean, I, I, I talked at great length with Peter about that conversation and NYSEG isn't going to apparently budge on this at all. So I'm, you know, I think that it'd be so good to reach PSC and send a letter that's really tailored to their their terms but you know I know we can't do that in this short period of time well we can we can do it on an individual basis mm -hmm. um, okay, I yeah I have a couple contacts at public service commission to add secretary to the commission as well as their public information officer so that's that's going to go on on the CAC letter. That's correct. Yeah. Referring referring to what Karen mentioned about that that you know, the comments from that NYSEG person in that article, um, I just wondered. You know, made me think that really that's going to be NYSEG's public dialogue argument. That do you New Yorkers want your rates raised, or do you want to protect this little parcel of land? that these environmentalists in Lansing are all you know, crazy about. So I think we need to, how much will it reduce people's rates? Uh, you know, I, at some, this is separate from the letter writing, but I think at some point somebody needs to be ready to rebut that public dialogue argument that's gonna be made. I totally agree, David. You know, I mean, I think it's just a, a question of, of like doing the simple math and finding out how many of the rate payers there are in, uh, who, who are served by NYSEG and possibly our G and E. And I mean, I think that, that that's an incredibly strong um, argument because if we say, you know, let's, let's say wildly, you know, it's, it's assessed at 2 million. Let's see, let's say that the bidding goes to, to 4 million, divide that by the number of rate payers. And what have we, what have we saved Nothing. You know, in rates as opposed to what have we lost. Exactly. Yeah. Like you're saving uh, every New Yorker 20 cents a year or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, and I think that, I think we need to force thing. people to think about that. It's a one time thing. Give them a dollar for one year. Be generous. Does anyone know how many people are served by NYSEG? No, or, but the Public Service what? Commission does have this obligation to the rate payers. That's their whole deal is protecting the customers like sure. they have but then now they have there are two competing interests that serve the public a conservation area and a rate decrease so how do we convince them that one is a greater public good than the other okay so NYSEG serves 907,000 electricity customers and 270,000 natural gas customers. So people on the average are going to get a one-time payout, let's say, of under $5. Right. Yeah. 
think that's that's interesting. I don't know if it's you know I think our our, our job tonight is to really finish this letter, but I'm not sure if it can go into the letter. But I think we that maybe the next and a subsequent step is to start being prepared for that kind of argument. Well, and even that five bucks is assuming they passed it all along to the ratepayers, which seems yeah. extremely doubtful to me. Exactly. Good yeah. point, John. I'd say it's more like zero. It might be more, you know, information to also have to any public officials who are sort of, let's say, on on the on our side to you know, in terms of interaction <laughs> or such, being able to rebut that argument. That would be good. So um, did people see the, um, the letter that um, Roger and Ruth Hopkins wrote? Um, they added, uh, we believe that the preservation outcome would be far more in keeping with NYSEG's environmental principles stated on their website. Uh, environmental stewardship. We conduct our business and facility operations in a manner that minimizes adverse environmental impacts on present and future generations. Uh, environmental policy, incorporate environmental impact considerations into decision-making processes concerning existing and future operations. Uh, communicate and demonstrate our commitment to sound environmental policies and practices. Support others who share our commitment to environmental stewardship and sustainable development. Well, they're not doing that now. That's great. If we can bring that in. Yeah. Um, but do we, do we add that into this letter? I mean, at some point we might lose impact if the letter is too long. Is, would you, anybody feel like that's a concern? I don't know how succinct we need, how much, sometimes being succinct makes, mm -hmm. sure that very busy politicians. This is, this is kind of a different subject since it's talking about the effect on NYSEG itself, which I don't think we're really talking about in other ways in the letter. Yeah, it does address an important point, I agree. It, it's, a, it's a very important point, but maybe it's a different subject in a, in a way. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it, uh, it deserves its own letter or, or its, own, its own separate um, publicization anyway. Well, do we just want to add a sentence that says that selling this land to the highest bidder is not in keeping with their uh, environmental principles stated on their website? Good. Uh, you could say that, but I think what Robin sense. said was, you know, about them them being actually having, you know, with their having their hands tied by PSC regulations about about how public assets are transferred. You would think that that would have come up in the years of discussion that, that that's been going on, but um, we have to wonder. I think, um, are you guys try trying to reference this section of public service law that talks about like the responsibility for long range programs and preservation of environmental values, conservation of natural resources, that kind of, it's a different section of public service law than section 70, but. Mm -hmm. Section five two. Um, I can pop that in the chat there. I mean, it's, I think a really fascinating question. I have no idea what the answer is. Um, well, I have reached out to um, council uh, who is doing some work for the town on the franchise uh, agreement um, renewal, um, which is not really associated. That's a charter uh, deal, but um, they do. Uh, work on uh, public service law, uh, which is its whole thing, evidently. Uh, and uh, we'll see what it can find about um, any recommendation for um, uh, advice or special counsel on these sections of public service law. But I think section 70 is not the sole criteria, I think is what I'm trying to say. That's really important. If there's another Popped in the section that, that talks about environmental responsibility in the Public Service Commission's um, mandate that should come into this for sure. 
Well, um, I can say DPS, uh, so staff to Public Service Commission is Department of Public Service, and they said that uh, um, they are not going to look at all of the bids and make their own choice, right? My understanding is NYSEG wants to send them all of the bids as well as a purchase, purchase and sale agreement. But my understanding is that Public Service Commission is only going to look at that actual transaction and determine whether it's in the public interest and then approve or deny that transaction, if that's making any sense. But I don't think- Meaning the highest bidder? Yeah, NYSEG is going to put forward a purchase and sale agreement of, of the highest bidder, but their intention is evidently to also send along any the whole list of bids as well. Like, but what DPS is telling me is that, you know, it's not an a la carte menu where the Public Service Commission just kind of arbitrarily or not, I guess maybe in some case, makes uh, decides for the the regulated utility which offer they have to take, if that makes sense. Yeah. So NYSEG decides and PSC just says yes or no. Yeah. Exactly. Well, what would people think about including the public service law piece that uh, CJ just put into the chat? That sounds like a very good idea. Okay, so let me um, let me just share the screen again so you could see how that would look if we did that. Uh, we could do it after the bullet points here. How about how about right after the public service law five part? That's it. That's the uh, that's the piece that. Oh, that, oh that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, basically, it's right in there now. And then we go on to there are a few public access points. And then, you know, frankly, it doesn't really extend it past two pages. We already had a little white space at the bottom. So, um, yeah, that's that, good. That's reasonable. It does seem reasonable to put that in there and kind of, it, it seems very germane. Uh, I just did it straight from the chat, CJ, so do, I hope uh, that's okay. It looks good. Great. Okay. So. Um, so it I, looks like there's a typo right there. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, right where your cursor is. Provides that. I think it must have been a capital T and it got. It's in brackets because it's a lowercase t. You got uh, it. Yep. And then it's um, another bracket, PSC. I don't see a typo, but let me know if but I'm missing something. Provides that. The PSC, quote, the uh, PSC shall encourage. Yeah. Yeah. Let me go. All right. So I will save that and send that to you, CJ, and copy Heather. Do we want to send a picture of the site? Just so they know what they're talking about, what, they're, what we're talking about? I the can't one, imagine the one. that they don't have a picture of it. But are you saying for Senator Helming and Anna Kellis's benefit or everybody's benefit. All the seats, all the people CC'd on this. Um, the picture that uh, Peter Mantius used was really nice. You want to screen share and show that, Tom? Well, I can try, but somebody else should try too if they if they have it. I think that that are you talking about the the header? Um, I think that 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 image, Tom, you know, it was either taken by Bill Hector. It might be right off of the auction company's video. 
No, I think it, the 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 picture that Peter had. I think it says it's Bill Head. Oh, okay. I don't see that on uh, on his article, but oh, maybe it, maybe it was in um, uh, the Tompkins Weekly article. Once we get the letter squared away, do you want to tell us about this resolution, Tom, and what this adds in addition to the letter? Um, it sounds like it, it, it can't directly resolve that the auction is being canceled, but it's urging that that happen. Um, I read through it and I agreed with it. I just wasn't clear on um, what the implications of this are. The town resolution, right? Yeah, the separate. Um, well, it's. I mean, it's basically ask, asking NYSEG to cancel the auction, which they say they're not going to do. And it doesn't carry any weight, really. This is just a ask. It Res didn't, the fact that it's resolved or passed doesn't mean anything, really. Yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, uh, NYSEG can just throw it in the in the in the waste paper basket if they want. Isn't Tompkins County also making having a resolution or they've already passed a resolution along the same line? But that, that too doesn't really have, yeah, authority, I guess, but it does, it's a little beyond, you know, individual letter writing or, you know, committee council letter writing. I think yeah. having these entities, these official uh, civil entities at a fairly high level municipal entities writing letters is pretty important. I think it's definitely a good thing to do. I just wanted clarification on whether the fact that it was a resolution meant anything other than the fact that it was an approved letter to be sent. It really doesn't have, there's nothing you can do in terms of enforcing it, it sounds like, if they don't want to agree with this. Well, I don't know. I assume that, you know, uh, you would think if you were going to be doing business in a particular township and the town board was against what you were doing, it could make life, uh, you know, make business uncomfortable for you. But that's about it, maybe. <laughs> I don't really know. Andrew, do you have any take on that, you know, in terms of the power of the town board in this situation? I, I, unfortunately, I think we're on the bottom of the totem pole. We're not, we don't have a lot of pull at all when it comes to the state deciding or different state commissions deciding things. You know, they, they sort of pat you on the head and said, that's nice, but just like the solar panel farms, we we really have very little hope or power, I guess. And um, I would agree. I mean, it would be very nice if every business that came into town sort of did the right thing or, or um, you know, went by all the rules. But even then, unless they do something terribly blatant, we we don't have the power to you know, to go after them at all. You know, Andrew, the other thing I was thinking about, because I was, you know, sort of praying that if some land, you know, more stringent environmental uh, zoning development laws got passed, that maybe that would zone out this property. But there's, there's basically, other than the gorges on that property, it's totally buildable with a slope of less than 10% over most of it. So, you know, I was, I was kind of banking on that as something that could be exclusionary, but um, not the case. 
So I, that that was my bad news that I figured out yesterday. So well, it's in an RA zone, which allows for lots of things to be built. Unfortunately, I mean I don't agree with that, but it's extremely, yeah. But what? I, I I know that there's been some talk about prohibiting development on steep slopes, and it just wouldn't even apply to this. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But what about L1? Some of it's L1. What's that mean? Lake. Lake. Uh huh. Isn't it? Is that more restrictive, CJ? Mm, as far as residential development goes, no. Um, but as for some other uses, yes. Well, let's get let's get back to a few things that were brought up. One is the photo. We didn't quite make a decision about that. Um, do you folks? I think I found it, Tom. Um, In the Tompkins Weekly. Uh, let me just see if uh, finger. In I found one from the Finger Lakes. Um, just let me just share my screen and you guys can tell me, is this the one that you have in mind, Tom? No. Okay. No. Let's All see right. if, let's see if I can uh, find it here. I mean, I think it's a, it's a little bit awkward keeping a photograph in a, a letter. Um, I don't know, just logistically, do you think that would work out okay, CJ and Heather, to, to put a photo? It looks like it's not gonna be this one. It's gonna be a different one. If we... Oops. It's up to you guys. It'll extend it beyond a front and back, if that matters. I've, I've not seen photos so, usually of companies. Can you guys see that? Am I sharing a screen here? Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, no. Yep. I am. That is pretty stunning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a real cool piece of property. Yeah, that's pretty stunning. That's good. Yeah, fall color showing and yeah. Yeah, very yeah. Se seasonal. I, I could sign on to that. Do you know if you have permission to share this photo? Yes, uh, Bill Heck said we could share any photos of his. Great. I really like it. I think I'd put it in. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, so those other, those other ones are from their video. Okay, so um, you want me to get it from Bill Hecht and put it in there? Do you want me to do a screen shot um, and steal it? You can, I can send you this one, I think. Okay. Uh, Gay Nicholson, Gay Nicholson want... sent out a bunch of, uh, a link to a bunch of uh, Bill Hecht's pictures and that's where uh, Audrey Warner who wrote that Tompkins Weekly article got it from. I can, Carrie, I can forward that link to you if you want, okay? Okay, that sounds great. So I'll do that before I send the letter to CJ and Heather. If everybody's fine, I propose we move on because we have a lot of other topics. Okay, we can do that. Is everybody comfortable with that? Or do we have anything else to say about Bell Station? I just want to add one more thing. I, I suppose most of you that went to the Senator's uh, little two hour hearing session got a letter back from her, um, you know, just saying thanks for you know coming. Um, but she listed um, specific agency people, commission, Basil Sago, so kind of going quite high up the chain. I don't see those on our letter. We're not going to uh, go up the chain like that. Yeah, I think we should have um, Commissioner of the DEC on there. 
It says, I encourage you to reach out directly to these officials and share your concerns. And so the uh, DEC Commissioner Liz Segos, uh, Secretary to the Commission, Honorable Michelle Phillips, James Dean, Public Affairs Office. I was going to ask the same thing. Yeah, I, th I think we should add those. Maybe a few of those key ones anyway. I mean, she's also got Senator Gillibrand and Schumer. I don't know if that's kind of a sure. little wacko, but maybe, why not? I don't know. Yeah. I, I think the further up we could get in the state yeah. power structure, the better. Yeah, if we have to really battle for this, I think we have to get to the point where it becomes kind of, um, I really think it could be battled a bit in the public dialogue in the news media. And if you get it at that level, then you have people like Schumer trying to defend saving everybody five dollars and but you know wiping out a major conservation area. You know, I don't know. Yep. I agree. I think this has to go, this is gonna to have to go beyond the town if any pressure is gonna be brought to bear that's gonna be adequate. It's, it's gotta be at the state level, don't you think? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Do you have that in front of you, David? The uh, I don't. You know, I don't have that as a PDF or anything. I just got the hard. I just got the hard copy of the letter. I haven't scanned it or anything. So um, I can tell you the names. Or do you want to take a picture and um, email it to me? Sure. Yeah. That'd be great. Thank it's you. Uh, it'll be two two pictures because it happens to be on separate pages. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything that where I can get them off and then. So we're in agreement that we're going to go ahead and add those to the CC list of this letter. Yeah, okay. I think that's a good idea. Okay. I'll run them off again. It's the two senators, the two state senators, uh, Schumer and Gillibrand, uh, commissioner of the DEC, um, secretary to the commission. I don't know exactly what that means, but the Honorable Michelle Phillips. That's the Public Service Commission. Yes. Uh huh. Public Affairs Office, James Dean, Public Affairs Information Officer of, of the Public Affairs Office. So those, I think, are the key ones. Just consumer complaints. I don't know about that one. So the other ones are Finger Lakes Land Trust, which, of course, we've already involved with. So. OK. Yeah, that's a good yeah. idea. Let's um, let's say. OK, uh, so I'll do that tonight if I get that from you. Um, OK. David. Uh, I think I got that list. Um, if you would just uh, take a look at what I just dropped into the chat, I oh, think great. that's what you're looking for. Uh, Michelle Phillips, Public Affairs Office, DC Commissioner, basically everybody on this list. Uh, it's like a four four page uh, contact list. These will all be added. I assumed that those would be you would want those to be added as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you just put that in the chat now, CJ. It says oh. list contact oh, info re bell station. Great, great. Yeah. So we'll add those as well. Okay, great. Um. I can't really open that up, but I'll oh, click to download. Okay. That's okay, do we, do we have any other discussion on the bell station? Okay. Um, just uh, one more. I just appreciate yeah. how the CAC really <laughs> responded quickly and rose to the occasion and everybody really got it. And I, that, that made it faster on our end. And I realize it takes time to get these things through, but you know, we're still learning how to work with the town board and also CJ's department. And so um, it just made it a lot easier to have everybody um, really responsive. And so just sort yeah. of thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was a very good rapid response, which is really, I think, yeah, it's times that critical times like this where you can have impact. Also, I've noticed a lot of other letters going around, they pretty much have used our letter as a basic, a base. So it's <laughs> Yeah. Useful. Yeah, that, I think uh, that's the best form of compliment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Open Space Index. Uh, I think CJ is probably the most qualified to talk about this. Uh, sure. Hey, uh, so um, I want to let you know that based on your recommendation um, uh, relative to the town of Bethlehem uh, open space plan, I think that was the one you guys said you mm -hmm. liked uh, the most. Uh, so it just happens that Jackie Hakes um, of MJ Engineering is also working with the town on a parks, recreation, and trails master plan. So I just reached out to her and said, hey, you know, would you talk to me for a few minutes about uh, scope of work for that project? Um, so uh, in essence, what they did was translate the um, NRI and uh, for town of Bethlehem into uh, essentially these conservation values. Uh, they've also worked on a couple of equivalent projects that, that I can send um, uh, you uh, links to as well, including um, the update for Saratoga Springs, uh, which started their open space planning back, I think, in 1992. So uh, it's cool that they're doing some uh, updates there. Uh, as well as Poughkeepsie is uh, working on an open space plan as well. So they've got those kind of in the hopper. Um, they estimated that it would, it would take them probably probably six to nine months uh, to do the plan. They certainly recommended robust um, public engagement, which is another uh, great reason to consider them bringing them on board. Uh, and so I still have to flush out the total um, scope of work there, but um, for utilizing the NRI uh, as a basis, uh, then uh, completion of uh, the mapping process, uh, including online story map, as well as any other mapping ideas that you guys um, want to put forward, um, as well as public participation, workshops, interviews, kind of like what they've done for the parks plan. And then um, developing that plan document, um, they gave me a scope of work of, um, somewhere between 50 and 75,000, um, which I assume will be on the higher end. Uh, so what I'd like to propose to do is uh, scope that out uh, with them, uh, maybe a little more fully uh, run that through you by email. And then um, uh, just so we can have kind of what you'd like to submit um, as a request to the Park Foundation at the end of this month. So um, rather than take up uh, meeting time with that, if you're cool with that, we'll just um, circulate by email. And um, you can let me know uh, what more you might like to add. Um, I was thinking maybe just like a OneDrive document that you could just add to. Um, I know I hesitate to bring that up again, but it's just a very simple <laughs> uh, Word document <laughs> we don't have to format it, just, just text um, to let me know kind of, uh, especially those of you with GIS and mapping experience, any insights on exactly what type of deliverables, any additional deliverables you might want will, will help me scope this out. Uh, and then from there, we can kind of decide what process you want to follow in terms of the actual procurement um, once we put in the grants application. Um, that's somewhat up to the town board um, to decide whether they want to do a request for proposal process or whether they would just like to um, hire out for this particular firm as professional services. Uh, so if that sounds good, I could just circulate that as an editable document. You can add what you want throughout the month. And then I'm planning to submit that on Friday, September 24th to Park Foundation. So, so you're saying the Park Foundation would basically cover the cost of this open space index hiring these consultants? Uh, well, I would like to um, graciously um, ask them, uh, of course, on behalf of the town uh, to consider uh, funding um, such a worthy uh, project, uh, I believe. Um, so uh, I think that that would be uh, within their wheelhouse. I think that they are very interested in funding those uh, types of projects. Uh, particularly within Tompkins County. So um, it seems like uh, worth um, worth a conversation at least and filling out the what I think is one of the probably world's easiest grant applications, if I may say so. So <laughs> anyway, for what it's worth, so, uh, it seems worth a shot. Yeah. CJ, have, have, you, uh, have you scheduled a one-on-one -on -one meeting with um, Amy Panic or whoever would be the program officer looking at this? Um, I have not scheduled a, a meeting with them individually, but we had corresponded recently um, about uh, some reporting uh, on our prior grants. Uh, so the town uh, was awarded uh, in 
2020, uh, a grant for, um, and Andre could give some more uh, details on this as well. Um, we're working on a stormwater uh, plan as well as a traffic impact uh, assessment, multimodal trip path. Uh, traffic impact assessment for the town center lands. Uh, and so we've started to establish a, a relationship with them as well. And um, uh, I heard back uh, recently from uh, Rachel um, about uh, uh, just making sure that they get updated on that work. And so I'm hoping to actually have that wrapped up here uh, very soon. So we're going to make sure we um, respond to them on that progress of that grant and thank them, of course, very much uh, for funding that. So um, but yes, I'm, I'm happy to do that, of course, on the CSC's behalf, if you'd like me to reach out to Rachel directly. I've found this incredibly helpful. Um, I think I mentioned I've been funded by PARC for the last 10 years, and I would say every time we submit a new grant proposal, we have a one-on-one -on -one talk with PARC. It's almost like sending a letter of inquiry, except it's, you know, it's more casual. And yes, it's an easy grant proposal. And yes, they are very generous with local projects, but they may um, have particular issues that they can um, counsel the grantee, potential grantee on um, to include. And um, they're, they're you know they're very open about that so just it's just a thought i've you know I found thank you i never I never submit anything without having a, a discussion first okay yes thanks for um for that good advice uh, karen. and maybe along those lines if uh, karen what's your opinion of somebody from the cac joining in on that does would that be too much or would that be appropriate? Um, I don't think it would necessarily be appropriate. Okay. Yeah. Of course this whole I, open space I, index I, thing, um, you know, the prize is Bell Station if we lose that this open space index thing is coming a little late, but we all know that. It's true. Karen, were you gonna say something? It appears everybody's muted at the moment. Is that right? No, there we go. I am muted. I was muted intentionally. I didn't have anything being polite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so I guess we'll all just wait to see what uh, CJ sends to us regarding the open space index. Sounds right. Okay, great. So we'll just, it's just, will be, you know, basically one page or so of just the broad scope of work. So definitely add on anything uh, you think I'm missing uh, and that you would like to see included in the scope and uh, we'll just the budget accordingly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, does anybody have anything else to say about the open space index? Okay, and on to the Ruoff conservation easement, which has become more complicated. Um, so the land that the Ruoffs, actually, um, Carrie, you talked to Sue directly, maybe you should. Yeah, I can, I can start us out. Um, just to bring people up to speed who might not have been at our last meeting, uh, we entertained the proposal to um, forward to the town board a recommendation that the Ruoff's property, 146 Myers Road, um, be considered for a conservation easement. Um, and we base that on the fact that it's uh, riparian, so that a large part of the property 
um, is right along Salmon Creek. Um, and it's somewhat of a uh, valuable um, riparian area. And also the uh, fact that the Finger Lakes Land Trust does not um, generally like to take on conservation easements for very small parcels. And this is a parcel that's under, uh, just under three acres. Um, it is right now um, contiguous with their home. They were proposing to put the conservation easement on only a piece of that land and then sell their house. In the meantime, they um, put their house on the market and they, this is since our last meeting, and actually have a signed contract for their home um, with someone who is um, very much predisposed to carry forth their wishes about a conservation easement or somehow preserving the land. Um, we also got some clarity from um, Lansing Planning Department on the fact that this, this land is um, landlocked, which of course we knew, um, but that um, essentially it really can't be developed unless they go through very special procedures. Um, and so in a sense, because conservation easements hinge somewhat on land that could be developed and it's then the development rights are assumed by, for example, the Finger Lakes Land Trust or the town of Lansing. Um, with this particular property, um, it would be very challenging to develop that land. Um, and meanwhile, um, the concept was um, explained to the town board and they were brought up to speed on this piece of property. And their, uh, as I, if I have it straight, their question back to CJ was, um, what is the CAC's process for considering conservation easements. Sort of along the lines, Karen, you were, you were going down this pathway also when you sent your email uh, to the CAC. And in fact, we don't have a process in place. Um, so it's a little bit cart before the horse, which we talked about at our last meeting. We knew that, um, but we felt like it could be uh, a starter and a, a place where we could all begin. So um, it has gotten a little bit more complicated. Um, Tom and I, and actually CJ talked pretty at length today about other options for this piece of property. Um, for example, putting attaching something to the deed that would prohibit further development and would protect the stream. Um, well, and that sounds like a great idea, but in fact, um, the town would be unable to enforce something like that. And since the Finger Lakes Land Trust would not be involved, there would not be an entity that would um, be able to protect uh, and make sure that that, um, what, whatever we would call it, um, attachment to the deed were, were carried out and followed uh, to the letter. So um, we're now in a situation where um, town board is really asking for a process and um, not so sure there is a high degree of enthusiasm on the part of Lansing's planning department um, for the reasons that I stated. And so we wanna bring it back to the CAC for um, further consideration. Um, and I guess the question to be put to you is, um, could you stand behind the possibility of us sketching out our criteria for conservation easements that would be held by the town and then putting the Ruoff property to the test of whether it meets our criteria. Well, since I wasn't here at the last meeting to, to vote on this, I still stand completely opposed to, um, to doing a conservation easement on that property. Um, feels very much like the tail wagging the dog and also for all of the other reasons that you've you've mentioned, I just think it would be a kind of a horrible way to start a conservation easement program. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's, there's not enough for me that, that triggers it um, to do all that work. But I probably am in the, like a minority of one on that. Um, 
but I do just want to make that clear that I'm really not in favor of this at all. I do think it would be a great thing to develop uh, guidelines, but not with the purpose of rushing to consideration of, of, of this. I sort of agree with Karen, actually. This is a weird little bit of property, you know, the funkiest house in town, I think, probably, with the exception of maybe Andrews. Um, what, what are we wanting an easement? For? What's, what's, our, what's our objective here? Why do we want an easement on that piece of property? It's riparian, it's all this stuff. The Ruoffs are volunteering this. Can the Ruoffs put something in their deed that restricts? That? Why don't they just do that themselves rather than involving us? I, I agree. Yeah, I agree. With I went point. and saw the piece of property with John. It is beautiful. It's cool. But there's nothing you could do there that's going to, it doesn't appear there's a lot that you could do there that would disturb the creek. And I happen to be a member of the Catholic Church that has some property, but we don't have any money. If we have to hire a lawyer and spend thousands to do something to get it into a conservation easement, nobody's going to vote on that to say, yes, we just don't have that kind of money. The Ruoffs do. We do not. And, and yet we're never, never, never going to develop that. Never. Well, that is actually really good to hear because, um, you know, as somebody who is interested in that property behind the Catholic church that's contiguous with the creek and the Ruoff property. Um, I'd be happy to help you guys like formulate some kind of management plan for that little piece and make it a little wildlife area. And if you think that they're not going to sell it, then you know that's an area that we don't need to worry about having a conservation easement on, right? That's actually good news. <laughs> Unless they decide that they do want to sell it and raise some money for the church. But, no, I, um, I don't think that's that's would ever be a possibility. I really don't. And 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 to get there is so difficult <laughs> to get down there. You have to be a, an experienced mountain climber or something. I mean, no, it's never going to be developed. And we have that that piece of land where there's an osprey nest, and we don't want that developed. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we believe in all that. I'm just saying. We don't want it formalized because we're we're not going to spend the money to do that. It, I'm kind of happy to hear that the planning board said it would be very difficult for them to do anything with the property. Yeah. Yes, uh, technically, according to CJ, it it cannot be subdivided because it has no road frontage. Mm -hmm. The new owners couldn't just decide that they want to build a second house there and connect up the driveway. That's just not allowed. No, the, to pull a building permit, you have to show that access is suitably improved. Um, and so they would either have to go through an open development area process, which ironically may actually could actually result in a conservation easement um, that sometimes in a sort of an agreement as part of open development. Uh, just to give you a hint of this, uh, so the process is town under town law 280A. Um, this is what an open development area process is. It's fairly unusual, kind of complex, and it's usually brought in when people want to develop land for which they actually have no suitable access for. Like say you have a landlocked parcel, uh, like this one is landlocked. Uh, you would need to go through um, uh, either a single or all muddled a lot uh, open development area. Uh, and then you'd go through this process with both the town board as well as the planning board uh, to actually uh, uh, approve that. So. Sounds like one of the things that I'm hearing is that like risk of development is one of our criteria that we should consider having as our rubric. You know, if it's not at risk, it's, it's lower down on the, it gets, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I, I, I certainly agree with uh, Karen's cart before the horse um, comment. Uh, I think we do need to think hard about uh, what our criteria should be and, uh, and prioritize them. And that's one good example. This, the, the time scale on this thing was just too short. 
Well, it certainly got us talking about the process of doing yeah. easements. So that's, that's great. Yeah. By by the way, this is slightly off the subject, but not too much. Uh, I can tell you that there is an active bald eagle nest on Salmon Creek. I'm not going to tell you where. <laughs> That's, it was active. You tell me. I, I, I will. <laughs> out. I, I will. Yeah. Um, eagles nests are federally protected, so. I know. Can't, yeah. Can't cut them down. I, 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 I just found this out. I haven't actually seen it myself. I know where it is. We'll, we'll follow up on that. So next, that, these are the same eagles you were seeing chasing the ospreys, John? Almost, almost 100% certainly. Yeah. 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 So next steps. Uh -huh. One of us lucky people will need to be in touch with the Ruoffs. Uh, I nominate <laughs> Tom. <laughs> I can I can do it. <laughs> no, we're, I'm happy to reach out on CSU's behalf. Uh, that's no okay. worries. Really? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I might uh, be more Just to say, uh, yeah, just um, you know, I'm happy to provide kind of some background, and it also would make sense because I have a number of email inquiries with them. So uh, that's no no problem. I'm I'm happy to do that. Okay. I mean, unless I don't mean to be uh, insisting, if you. No, that that's perfect, CJ. Because um, it's like it's not that we don't think that's a great piece of land to conserve. It's just the mechanism doesn't seem very clear, um, and it seems like it's pretty well protected by itself. So it's um, yeah, I think we're not we're not poking the Ruoffs in the eye. We're just <laughs> yeah. Oh, this of is, course, no, yeah. no, I wouldn't. Uh, I certainly would uh, do my best <laughs> to um, just characterize this as. Um, just uh, an evaluation uh, and also that the uh, CAC is just still in the process of developing its um, right. you know, implementation for um, acquisition of conservation. Easements. And we love what they've done to protect the land. It's awesome. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, yeah. It's not totally voted off the island. I mean, once we have our process in place, uh, you know, the new owner could suggest the CE again and then, you know, there's there's a chance that it could get through the uh, the screen that we've set up, depending on what our yeah our criteria look like. We don't know. No. That's perfect, Carrie. Yep, we we need we need a, we need a process before we can actually do this. And, and yeah. yeah, that's kind of where we are. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Good. Great. So, how do we get this process going? Uh, so uh, my understanding is that we wanted to uh, start undertaking the open space open index, space. Um, of which uh, that criteria would be developed as part of that. Uh, could be done really side by side, okay. um, and it can be really as simple or complicated as you want it to be, or as nuanced. Um, we could start with kind of an initial set of guidelines that were kind of pretty simple, and then develop it as the open space index is uh, is also developed. Uh, but basically, you know, the criteria we're looking for is that um, uh, even if the town doesn't want to necessarily see a minimum acreage uh, in what we would accept uh, for a conservation easement, uh, we generally want the parcel to be uh, developable because that, uh, in essence, would be the real and public benefit uh, to the town. Uh, I don't know if there's a better way to characterize mm -hmm. that, uh, but... Uh, in any event, uh, we could, if you'd like, kind of start with um, some initial guidelines and start fleshing those out. But I figured that's something we're going to work in tandem with uh, on the Open Space Index. And I thought that was one of the uh, reasons you really <clears throat> like the town of Bethlehem's work is because they really did do a really, I think, bang up job on the conservation criteria that they developed. So, yeah, yeah as I recall, our conversation last time, um, it wasn't clear to me that this land was undevelopable and you know impossible to develop. So that makes a difference. Um, so I think you know that is should be one of our criteria that the land is you know is vulnerable to development if something isn't done, which Robin already mentioned. And then I think the other we 
we're working with last time, and I think would maybe we still would go on just to kind of start building some of these criteria, was that um, we would be looking for parcels that are of sort of a size that um, don't meet the, the, the scale that something like the Finger Lakes Land Trust is likely to go for. So we would have a, we kind of envisioned our, our, our role as something to fill a niche that is not something that the Finger Lake Land Trust would take on or some other entity like that. And we also talked last time about this simply being, I mean, we, we had an owner who was into it and we had, um, and it was something um, relatively low risk for the town to take over and, and deal with. Yeah, as a first step, you know, a big step uh, towards getting into these things. So just kind of, yeah, throwing some ideas out there based on our conversation last time and what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Uh, so CJ, um, you were mentioning, I think when you were describing um, the consulting firm that it, it could take six to nine months. Did I get that straight um, for the OSI uh, to be developed? Yeah, from start to finish, um, but that was uh, figuring a bunch of public engagement as well. And, um, you know, uh, maybe it wouldn't take that long, but I'd like to be a little more on the conservative side. Um, okay. But uh, like I said, if you wanted to start drafting something at least kind of preliminary uh, to work with, you know, maybe set some foundational pieces um, that you all agree on relative to acquisition of conservation easements. Um, we could certainly do that. And yeah, it just seems like if, you know, it'll take a while to engage Jackie, because we're going to have a little bit of a, you know, round robin. And then by the time they come on board, then if we're looking at six to nine months, then we won't have our criteria in place for almost a year. And I guess I'm feeling more impatient than that. You know, other opportunities could come up and we would be still saying, oh, well, we don't have our criteria in place. So, um, I don't know, I'd like to get a sense from the CAC whether other people are feeling as impatient as I am about getting something in place. You mean impatient about the criteria for a conservation easement? Right, that the, that the town could hold. So I posted in the chat, the town of Bethlehem, Bethlehem has this uh, kind of conservation value score chart um, page 14, 15 that I really liked. You could use something like that and just start a informal rubric for how we would consider any, you know, proposed property, should they be proposed before we complete it, we could use that as, or a modified version of that as our rubric. And there must be something like this that exists. I don't think we have to build it from scratch. Mm -hmm. That's my point, I guess. not done by the time this program starts that could be a priority couldn't it to make sure we address some of that stuff early on in the process CJ's putting something in the chat uh, this was that little assessment uh, I sent around uh, last time but just very broad strokes on kind of a point um, kind of system uh, for agricultural resources, ecological resources, and historic uh, greenway recreation resources uh, that we can that we can tweak a little bit. Uh, this was just meant to be kind of a, a initial draft uh, about that. So I guess you could say we maybe have some guidelines uh, ready to go oh, here if you want to make that draft. Um, but um, um, we could certainly, I'd be happy to have folks put their eyes on this and uh, send some comments uh, on it. Uh, so we could do something similar to the um, exercise for the open space index and just, you know, simply put it in a OneDrive document and circulate that around so that folks could just add some comments. We could start there. It's kind of an assessment. I would be in favor of that. That sounds good. Is there another CAC person who would want to shepherd that along a little bit? 
can help with this. Um, okay. I'm looking at the first draft and comparing several different versions that I can find and seeing what we might want to add to it to personalize. That would be awesome. Okay, so we're going to start this process um, sort of based on the Bethlehem model. And that'll be our first step at this. Sounds good. Is that our understanding? Hey. Yeah, it sounds good. I mean, I have myself haven't, you know, really looked at that Bethlehem document. So, you know, I could make a point of before our next meeting to have really looked it over and be ready to. It's, it's a nice document and, and it's, it's only 43 pages and, mm -hmm. and it's big print. <laughs> so <laughs> that's good. <laughs> Sounds like my kind of yeah. thing these days. So, yeah, I, it's, I thought they did a really nice job with that. I think one thing that's going to be pretty interesting, depending on how long COVID goes, is um, what the public participation process is going to be and how we can do it in a way that's going to really um, generate a rich set of information. Because, um, you know, having, having an online planning charrette is you know, it, it, it kind of loses something <laughs> over people being clustered around, a, you know, a table and, and pointing and moving things around. And so that would be, um, given that we have no idea how long we're going to be not having in-person meetings, I think that would be a really interesting question to make sure that we pose to this consulting firm and what their ideas are. The, um, I, I thought the, the uh, parks, assessment, which was all online, was done really well. And, and I think they, they got quite a bit of participation. Yeah, for, I, didn't, I didn't feel very much part of that. And I have been part of some of these in-person ones and I, you know, a lot. And I would just, I would just love to see something creative. Well, I got a sneaky suspicion this um, COVID thing is not going away anytime soon. I just think that, you know, so there's a, there's a real opportunity for the consulting firm to develop uh, interactive media and, and there's just a whole lot of, of rich creative things that you know, I can imagine are out there, but I couldn't describe what they are right now. Do you have any thoughts on that, CJ? About how, how to get around? You know, this is a super tricky one, I think, for planning these days. Oh, and by the way, it looks like open meetings law is going to be um, suspended again. Uh, it's going to be through January 15th, so all boards will be going back to meeting on Zoom uh, pretty soon again here is my guess. Um, well, we'll see uh, about town board, but uh, planning board and zoning board will for sure. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a really good question. And uh, I can say that the Parks, Recreation, and Trails Advisory Committee, when they were interviewing candidates, um, did put a, a pretty good emphasis on ideas for public engagement. Um, and I put the link in so you could see what MJ did. Um, but that said, um, you know, we don't necessarily have to go with one specific firm. And if you'd like, and that's why I was ex uh, expanding that timeline a little bit, because I thought you might want to go through a request, request for proposal process. I was thinking maybe you wanted to invite some firms actually to apply uh, to do the job because it's a pretty, you know, sizable contract and likely to be a sizable contract, I should say. Um, and so if you wanted to talk to a few firms uh, or more than one, right, like we could have a, one firm do the public engagement um, who specializes in that kind of work, um, which is a, tall, a whole subset of planning. Um, 
you know, we could certainly do that too. So um, if that's something that you'd like to see a bit more robust, um, I can make a point to highlight that in the uh, scope of work uh, that will circulate. I would just say even within Zoom uh, features, uh, just having run a class with 40 students a couple of times now with Zoom, where um, it's a climate change class and small discussions, getting students to talk <laughs> is very important to getting into all the controversial issues. You know, using the breakout room feature of Zoom and getting people to talk in small groups that get to know each other, um, and then coming out and reporting to the full entity is one way to get, get more input from almost everyone. Um, and there's also, of course, just, you know, like uh, I'm sure we've all experienced this thing of um, having someone who's monitoring a meeting and people can put their questions in a chat rather than having to raise their hand and break into a, a dialogue. Somebody periodically uh, reading out what's in the chat and making sure that everything that goes in the chat gets entered into the discussion. So there's some ways to get even the shy among a participant group um, engaged just with Zoom features. But I'm sure consultant groups, all the big bucks they get, they might have some more creative ideas. <laughs> so we can see what they come up with. Just looking at the link that you sent, CJ, and I had seen this previously, it, it did seem like um, they made an effort to um, you know, get people into smaller groups and looks like there were breakouts. And there's something to be said for going with a firm that the uh, town feels good about and that they have a little bit of a track record with the town. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to ask for um, proposals from more, more than one source. Yeah. But it sounds like first we have to get some funding for this. Mm -hmm. So in the in the grant proposal to Park Foundation, we will not necessarily specify the uh, firm, correct? Okay. Correct. We can leave it open that way, and then you can decide whether you know work. Uh, you know, advise the town board basically on what you think the best uh, move would be. If you think it would be to hire a firm directly, you could certainly advise town board to that effect. Um, or if you'd like to receive a request for proposal process, we'd prepare essentially um, uh, requests for proposals and um, we put that on contract reporter. It would go to, you know, uh, selected firms. Uh, so ones that you want to receive it directly and then who knows. Um, for the Parks, Recreation and Trails Master Plan, I think we received 21 proposals wow. or nine, maybe 19. Wow. Uh, and so from there, we developed kind of a matrix uh, of uh, decision making to weight different criteria of kind of what they really wanted to prioritize. So it's really up to you. That's typically a, you know, a, a quarter long process in and of itself um, to just do the issue, the RFP, do the interviewing uh, and really uh, prioritize what you want out of it. But um, I think all in all, the uh, town, uh, at least the Parks and Recreation Department, I think, um, is satisfied with um, the outcome of the, from going through kind of the, something of a laborious process to select the firm um, that they wanted to work on their plan. So uh, kind of leave that to you on how you'd want to recommend. So town regs do not require us to have competing bids and to choose among them. It's possible to choose one firm if we wanted to. Uh, well, if you read that recommendation to town board and then town board authorized um, that contract, uh, that's because of professional services um, are considered to be um, something uh, much more fluid, say, than purchasing as far as procurement goes. Um, and the town does have that uh, as a written policy. So okay. uh, we would, of course, follow the town's written policy on procurement. Okay. Uh, but professional services are generally speaking exempt. Okay.
do we want to decide on that now or actually wait and make a decision at a, like our next meeting? I don't have strong feelings about it. Um, I would assume that we would all be the ones that would rank different candidates and proposals and we would get group consensus and make a recommendation to CJ to put forward. So we'd all have to read 10 to 20 proposals if they came through <laughs> and to rank them. <laughs> well, I mean, this this firm has been vetted by Parks, Recreation and Trails Committee, so. And they may or may not have capacity to do this work. Do you, yeah. do you know that? Mm -hmm. Do you know if they have capacity to do this project right now? Uh, yeah, I believe so. That was their take on it, that they do have um, those two other plans going that I mentioned. Um, but that's something I can certainly confirm with them. Uh, and that's uh, generally speaking when, uh, if we were to issue a request for a proposal and when we also flesh out a scope of work, uh, we'll have a timeline to go um, with that scope of work as well to kind of say what we would prefer. And so, um, you know, if, if that's important to you, we can, of course, like I said, go through the request for proposal process and we can really see who's um, got the most availability and capacity. Um, but that said, you know, I would advocate, of course, going with the firm that that you think, um, you know, brought the best value uh, to the process that you want. So uh, we can talk more about that after we um, get the grant application uh, in in the scope of work and timeline. Then we can decide what process uh, that you might like to do. You have some discretion here. OK, so it sounds like we're not going to make a firm decision on whether we go with a request for a proposal or just try and hire this one firm for now. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's fair to do that at our next meeting. You know, get, be, we'll be more prepared, I think. Okay. Or even, you know, we probably have time. I don't know what Park Foundation schedule is, but um, you know, we, we won't have the funds for a while, but but I think it it would be possible to work in parallel with uh, getting the funds. Okay, they work on a, a quarterly basis, so the proposals are due usually beginning of January, uh, April, you know, whatever, every three months. And it's generally... Um, I think usually about two months, two to three months after you submit that you get notified. So, you know, plan on, plan on, you know, at least a few months. And it, it may be, might make it into the next, the next round, which would be what, September? Mm -hmm. 24. So maybe not, maybe, maybe the, maybe the next one. I think we're hoping for the 24th. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I was shooting for the, the 24th so that we can make sure it was in the 2022 work plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then it would, you probably would get notified by uh, whenever after their next board meeting, which, you know, probably be in December. I think December. Okay. Uh, Want to move on to the overlay districts, Tom? Okay. Um, let's see. That's not on the agenda here that I have, but yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, we, we kind of skipped that step of adding those two things. Uh, so we wanted to spend a few minutes on these environmental protection overlay districts as is tied in with our work plan. Um, so I think you will all remember our, um, our last work plan, which we looked at in June, um, has on it in two different places, these overlay districts, one having to do with the uh, Cuga Lake Scenic Byway and the other having to do with these um, draft um, 
environmental protection overlays that uh, we were entertaining quite a few months ago and wanted to get back to. Um, and um, es essentially, I think our, our task is uh, the, town, the town board is looking for progress um, on these overlay districts and um, uh, the CAC has it on, on the work plan. And um, if we can make, make some progress on these, I think that it will actually in the future, possibly assist the planning board <clears throat> and ultimately the town. Um, but maybe, I don't know, CJ and Tom, you can add a little bit more to that. Well, the overlay districts came up at one of the planning board meetings and um, it was a little confusing. Um, and there was concern that uh, uh, the planning board does not want to take uh, people's property rights by putting it in an overlay district and saying you can't develop here, which is not what, I mean, that's, that's I think they were not understanding what, what the overlay district was. Um, but that's, that's their concern is they don't want to be, um, taking away property rights from private landowners with an overlay district. So what, one of the tasks at the CAC um, is um, currently being asked to tackle is whether we could weigh in on the geographic extent um, of these overlay districts. And CJ, you could probably <clears throat> explain that better, maybe even we could be looking at a map so that people can have a visual um, of just one example, whereby we have right now two different approaches that we could be following. Do we um, specify scenic points? Uh, for example, along the uh, Hugo Lake Scenic Byway, do we, do we specify scenic points that need to be protected um, regardless of how skinny or wide they might be. That's how I kind of think of it. You know, we're hemmed in north and south because town of Lansing only goes so far, but then uh, west to east, there's, there's a lot of land to work with and we're not gonna protect all of it or we won't have any development whatsoever. Um, so we need to be thinking about, okay, uh, what, what's the rationale that we're going to use? Is it gonna be scenic points or is it gonna be some type of uniform um, standard, for example, 300 feet um, and, looking at maps might give us some uh, assistance as we as we begin to think through, okay, can we give some guidance to the, the planning board? Okay, uh, so just real quick, um, to show you guys, this is a kind of the extent. Uh, so like Carrie was saying, you know, the scenic byway uh, is, uh, I goes north to south and so uh, it would presumably be uh, covered by uh, the entire uh, length right from the town line here which is a uh, the town line uh, all the way to the northern town line here which happens to also be the county line uh, what I was trying to understand is um, you guys made uh, some really great uh, view shed maps essentially of um, some views from some points. Uh, and I think what I'm trying to ask is, and trying to get a hold of for the, the planning board is, uh, should there be essentially a uniform distance? So as wiggly as this looks, um, this is, I think, 200 feet or maybe 300 feet from the scenic byway uh, looking, uh, heading east. And then it goes west all the way to the lake. So this kind of weird cross hatching kind of thing that you see would be the extent of where the scenic overlay districts would apply. Now the rules themselves or something, you know, the, the planning board uh, could work on, but I think it'd be super helpful to understand whether the CAC would recommend something like this, which is pretty uniform in its application. Uh, meaning, you know, you have the scenic byway and then you have 300 feet east of that that's just a solid you know uh easy uniform number 
or would you like to propose something that addresses more the actual kind of physical landscape that accounts for the topo that accounts for some more of those very scenic points distinctive points um, as far as enforcement goes it would be a little trickier we'd have to probably um, finagle that one a little bit but um, it would probably more accurately grab uh, the areas which you're looking to protect i really have to defer to you guys on this one because uh, whatever you guys think the zoning should be in terms of the geographic extent is, you know, would help me a lot. Was there a reason for the 300 foot that I'm not remembering or was that an arbitrary uh, starting point? Or is that just the distance from the road to the lake <laughs> for, on average? Uh, it was. It would be the distance. Um, what I had proposed was um, uh, from the scenic byway west all the way to the lake. That's kind of just the uniform application there because that's easy to apply, right? You know, just everything west of uh, the scenic byway looking towards the lake would apply. But then there was also this kind of sense that yes, the farmland and open spaces are also distinctive of the scenic byway looking east. So you know, how much of that do you grab? And, you know, zoning has an obligation to be uniform in its application, but it doesn't have to be, you know, 200 feet, 500 feet. It can, it can follow the whole idea of overlay districts, of course, is that they could follow the environmental features and not just arbitrary tax map boundaries or, you know, some random number. So that's kind of why I'm looking to you to kind of see, you know, in some places, is it going to be maybe 600 feet? Is it going to be, you know, kind of looking for that guidance on kind of, how, you know, how would you do this, you know, if you were looking to apply this in a fair way that actually does what you want it to do, which is to preserve scenic resources, right? Or at least make sure that development is in harmony with those scenic resources and applies very specifically in these areas. I think it's a fascinating question because, you know, the, the landscape, the natural part of the landscape is continually going to be changing. So, you know, where there may not be a hedgerow now in 20 years, that could be grown up and completely, uh, you know, block a view of a, you know, a, a, a mansion that's sitting on the cliff and visible from you know from half a mile away so I, I yeah it brings up all kinds of interesting questions there and at the same time you know people and developers and just about anybody are oh it's a lot easier for them to work with just a set number but I think that you miss you lose a lot of opportunities to pr protect those view sheds if it's a you know, if it's an expansive view with an ugly house in the middle of it. That's one of my questions is if we were to go for um, the scenic uh, points path that you're describing, would we have to basically do each scenic view on a case by case basis and make a view shed of it and then determine um, the unique features of that particular site it seems like it would take so much more work. Maybe it would be a lot more worthwhile, but it would take so much more work than to just slap a uniform 300 feet uh, criterion on that. Well, this sounds very complicated to me because I remember even we were just looking at the photos of some of those scenic vistas. Um, yeah, you could, <sighs> It's hard to put a you know restriction on, on distance that you want preserved, and um, I don't know. It sounds very complicated to make those decisions point by point. I'm that sounds like a complicated job. I'm also uh, maybe I just need to back up and be refresh my memory refresher. I don't really understand to the people who own that property that is encompassed by this by these overlays. What exactly are the restrictions that are put? Uh, 
Uh, so that's a good question. And that would be really up to the planning board to design those. But my yeah. conversations with them, uh, which have been kind of just high level and trying to tease out um, information. And Tom, of course, um, feel free to uh, chime in here. Uh, we did have the Cuga Lake, uh, um, uh, what is it, the, the scenic byway, the Cuga scenic byway folks came to actually talk with the planning board, uh, which is kind of cool to understand their development perspective a little as well. But what I was hearing from the planning board is that they really wanted to see at the time of submission uh, for projects located within these areas would be you know, some example of the scale and massing of the proposed structure uh, requiring peaked roofs, um, you know, some level of um, pitched roofs, uh, as well as um, essentially a required design review. So that would be material choices, um, maybe a palette of material choices that would be available, as well as possibly a color palette uh, that would be uh, required, as well as um, essentially, you know, a height dependent on the slope uh, of the area so that um, uh, you wouldn't have, you know, tall buildings just kind of um, leaping out of um, mm -hmm. the scenic landscaping, I, I think, um, you know, and just uh, limitations on things that you would kind of expect in an area like that, like, you know, no you know, neon or, you know, okay, day glow so. paints and stuff like that. Um, so that's what my understanding of what they'd be looking for was kind of a, you know, more uh, strict design standards within those areas that would be respectful of the uh, scenic nature of the byway while also, you know, accommodating some development, right? The yeah, because I'm just thinking of something like, uh, especially um, thinking about the east side, which you're looking at a rural landscape, and it would seem appropriate to me to have, let's say, a, a, a quaint roadside stand there that some farmer, you know, something that's kind of fits in, uh, not some big ostentatious um, supermarket, but something that would be a farm roadside stand would be the kind of thing that would not offend me as a citizen of the area. And I would not like a farmer to be on my back because I, you know, they couldn't put up a roadside stand um, on their farmland there. So, but it just seems like, you know, that's my opinion. And we probably have <laughs> nine different opinions on this board. I don't know. It's, whew, it's getting into tricky waters. Um, but I, I agree some kind of restrictions should probably be placed. Uh, but um, trying to figure out what, what those are. And then, and then on top of that, also thinking the width might be changing based on some personal judgments of something in the distance that, you know, some one of us or a group of us thinks looks really cool um, from a distance. And so it's got to be protected all the way to some, I don't know, interesting old church or something that's 10 miles away. I don't know. It's, so I lean towards having it certainly like kind of more uniform to keep it simple, because I think it's going to be complicated enough, even just thinking about if we're supposed to actually provide some suggestions on these restrictions, or is that totally up? That's not up to us at all. No, I think that's the, we're supposed to provide some guidance. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that alone would be tricky. Oof, yeah, that's an interesting area to get into. I have a big uh, responsibility, actually. Thinking about the balance between, uh, you know, private landowners' rights to, uh, you know, not have to go through some incredible, crazy process um, to do something that's actually quite reasonable. So, yeah. So, I, I, a um, uniform width does make a lot of sense in terms of simplicity, but maybe we, you could also have some particular nodes that are different. Yeah, you know, a few, they're, a few they're very exceptions. special. Yeah. Um, and, and the planning board, they would really like to have more authority on what can go in places in the sense that you know, there's talk of another Dollar General. Yeah, right. I was going to say another dollar store. Right, right. Stop every, Cecil. Every corner and, and, you know, yeah. we did, we did um, this one that's going in across from Linda's Diner on 34. I mean, the planning board did have them make some changes. So it's not going to look like the Dollar General that's, that's uh, off of East Shore Drive there. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
but but the the planning board does not have much authority at all. Um, you know, it seems to me one of our major roles is just trying to mitigate um, contention among neighbors when something's going in, and so we try to make things so that the neighbors are happier than if we didn't in, <laughs> engage. Mm -hmm. And and one of their complaints are, well, you know, we don't have any teeth to do anything really. We can just propose things. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, the planning board would like to have the backing have a little of more authority on on what's mm -hmm. how how things look. Yeah, they yeah. they don't want to. I mean, in general, you know, they're not anti-development, but they want the development to at least have some aesthetic appeal. Yeah, and certainly the scenic byway is in a way, you know, um, you know, in a, in a different way, uh, in, a, in a somewhat developed way, but it, it's like our, it looks like Salmon Creek. I mean, it's a special, it's a special streak <laughs> across Lansing that we do want some level of preservation. I mean, I get that. We want some level of care on how that's, that's handled. When I think about places that are scenic that you go to because they're scenic, like the Adirondacks or, you know, historic Cape May, New Jersey with a bunch of historic houses, it seems like they're historic because they're a continuous stretch of scenic or they're scenic because it's a continuous stretch, not because there's a, a house here that's historic and pretty and another one over here and a giant Walmart with fluorescent lighting in between. If, if it's going to be a scenic byway, it, it seems that it should be the width of the road to the lake and not individual points. Because if something goes in between those individual points, then it's no longer a scenic area. Yeah, I, I agree. Certainly, when the road to the lake all the way all the way along should be. And I'm not hearing that there can't be any development, but just if they're going to put in a truck stop, maybe it can be made of wood and slate and look nice and not have fluorescent lighting and you know giant solar beams into the sky at night and it could be actually be a more scenic structure i'm not hearing that it you can't have any development but that the restrictions would just be on the way that the development looks and how much it has to blend into uh -huh. the landscape yeah and it, it might not even apply to small structures like a farm stand or a somebody's you know, thing that they put up in their backyard, it sounds like it would only be new development. Yeah. And major development. So I guess I would be in favor of the continuous strip approach versus individual points. Yeah, I mean, I tell you, I drive that a lot because either going from Lansing to Ithaca towards Cornell, or I go up uh, to um, Poplar Ridge where there's some great tennis courts at the school there, the South Cayuga School. Um, and I just love that drive. So, I mean, I totally appreciate this, the scenery along that drive, along 34B, so I get it. It's mostly rural and the beautiful views of the lake and not a lot of development. Making, it all, <laughs> making it all the way to the lake I mean, there's a lot of places on that scenic byway where there's, you know, you're not going to see the lake. Yeah. So that that might be a little extreme. Um, I have a question about how the planning board has responded to uh, things like the the draft document we got early on for a Cuga Lake scenic byway overlay district. That that outlined the purpose, permitted uses, the district extents, the um, lot area, yard requirements, buffers. You know, is is that something that the planning board has seen and said has to go back to the drawing board, or is that something that the planning board has seen and wants the the CAC to fine tune what has been their response 
I don't think there was any kind of detailed response on that. Okay. CJ, what is your recollection? Uh, so, yeah, I think there was some concern that um, the restriction on uses perhaps uh, could have, might be a bit broad. Uh, so that's why we kind of, uh, I'm asking us to pull back a little and really think more about, you know, the geographic extent in terms of when we go to apply this, you know, where is this going to apply to? And I really wanted to, I think the planning board really got a lot out of the presentation that Todd gave on the natural resources and scenic resources inventory. And I think that's when it became uh, evident, oh, okay, you know, somebody's gone out and, you know, uh, looked at all these points, taken a look at the, the uh, scenic resources in the town. And from there, I'd like them to really dig into some of the use issues. And uh, so that's where I'm really looking for CAC to really advise on, um, you know, are we, thinking about the viewshed observable from specific scenic points, or are we looking to just really think about that person who's going along the scenic byway and really a uniform distance? And this is not something you have to answer right now. I'm just kind of asking, you know, maybe mull it over based on all the work you did on the SRI and the NRI. And, you know, maybe next meeting we could start to come up with, um, you know, some of those ideas and we can, leave the uses and site site improvements to them. Although I would anticipate, of course, you would review a, uh, a draft of the regulations, of course, before they were adopted, um, but just kind of leave the actual like planning and land use pieces to them and really help us kind of hone in on the scenic, the real actual scenic portion of, of the zoning and where it applies. Basically, I just need to know if we come up with rules related to design standards and form and other types of criteria like that, where should they apply based on your very specific experience? So no need to answer this question right now. It was just meant to be a think it over kind of thing. There's something, uh, it's just really tricky for me to think about this because I, I like I said, I, I love that drive. And um, it's what I, what would be disturbing to me is simply see something that seems totally out of place. It just doesn't fit in with, with the ambiance of, of the drive. So if you're, you're cruising along, it's basically rural on one side, a uh, beautiful lake view and forestry type stuff and some rural on the other side. Um, and you don't wanna see, as you were saying, like, you know, neon signs or, you know, there's, there's certain things that are just clearly way out of uh, uh, obvious. So, um, I, you know, I think we, uh, what we be, should be preserving is making that, yeah, it has to, it has to remain a scenic byway and, and be not something that uh, jars people back to uh, feeling like they're in some um, urban jungle somewhere. So anyway. But are we just talking about the byway or are we talking about all of the scenic points? I thought just the byway. About, we're talking about more than the byway. We're, oh. we're talking about Oh. Uh, stream corridors. We're talking about steep slopes. These are these are mm, all okay. packages as part of these environmental. Um, You're features. talking about overlay districts, the different yes. overlay districts. Yes. Okay. These are essentially environmental features that aren't following uh, parcel lines. We're trying to get a handle on that. It could. Would I be able to just for a second show this this draft of the overlay district for scenic lake? Uh, Cuba Lake Scenic Byway just for a moment so we can get a handle on what part we would need to focus on. Um, so here, here's a draft. I don't know if it's one of the later ones or not, but it describes the purpose um, about, here it is, Cuba Lake Scenic Byway, permitted uses, district extents, um, permitted accessory uses, lot area yard requirements. And there's the there's a buffer requirement and then additional design and operating standards. So CJ, you're saying essentially if we were to mark this up, that the planning board would actually take on certain parts of this, right? They would say, hey, we're in charge of 
Yeah, you'll. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, uh, for you guys, I'd really just want to see initially um, just to try to start to define that geographic extent. Because frankly, I think that's some of the hard of the hardest parts of it is um, really delineating where you want this to apply. And you guys have spent a lot of time thinking about the scenic resources of the town. So um, okay. it would be wonderful to kind of have that input. The rest of it uh, needs to be tweaked and would go through planning board um, and then come back to you uh, as part of that final review in terms of um, the actual content itself. But, oh, but when you say where we, we would want this to be applied, you're talking about this kind of list of guidelines. Yeah. And think of it more broadly. I think this is, um, I'm not saying, I'm not uh, saying that this is wrong, or I'm just saying that um, I'm trying to go kind of really broad with the conversation with planning board um, to really uh, understand what it is that they want in terms of the form and look of what's built there. And then we'll tailor the regulations around it. And I would need you guys to help me figure out where those things should apply. Where is it most important that we really make sure that materials and design is uh, cohesive with the scenic environment is what I'm trying to say. Um, the rest of it will follow. The language, no worries. Just help me with the map, I think is what I'm really trying to say. So essentially, okay. it's not on here. What, what we need to be looking at and working with, it's just not here. We need a map, really, right? You've got it. Okay. And I would like to send one around to you, just a draft of it um, for you to take a look at. I think I may have circulated already, but um, I'm happy to send that again. And I'm really just um, looking for feedback uh, from you on where you think this should apply and how you think it should apply. Do you want it to be more tailored by relative to the scenic resources inventory, or do you want to have something just a bit more uniform? Um, so I will circulate that to you as well, and I'll try to keep it short and sweet. And just so this doesn't drop into the oblivion, because it, it is, it's a challenging concept, I think, for us to get our hands around. You know, would there be a person on the CAC who's willing to um, devote a little time between now and the next meeting to uh, considering the map and maybe gnawing on this a bit, or maybe two people. Uh. Well, I've only got a week or 10 days before I'll be extremely busy till November. <laughs> But in that period of time, I would like to go through a lot of this because being a landowner, people like myself would be very much affected by mm -hmm. something like this. Mm -hmm. And I can and I can see, you know, Tom's initial comments about people being concerned about, um, you know, their rights being restricted with how they can um, use their land when they're paying the taxes on it and everything is... Mm -hmm whenever you get into zoning that's a a huge issue <laughs> you know mm -hmm. who really controls the land and how mm -hmm. and why yeah. so well, i would definitely like to be involved in and in looking at it but um for a good chunk of this fall i'm going to be extremely busy it sounds like it's a t it's a time limited offer right yeah. next yeah. next 10 days Okay, that's fair. That's fair game. Uh, I I would be willing to spend a little time doing that with you, uh, and then maybe Tom, could we run some stuff by you, given your knowledge of the planning board? Sure. Okay. All right. It'd be great. Good. Working everybody hard. <laughs> well, so Carrie, we've covered everything. Is that right? Yeah, it, we really have. At some point, we'll go through our uh, work plan again. But we've we've hit some points on the work plan tonight, so I think we're good. 
Okay. Great. So does anybody else have anything to add to our wonderful meeting? <laughs> Thanks for facilitating. I guess, I guess I, I'd just like to agree with everything David said about, about what we've just been talking about. It seems really complicated to me. And um, yeah, I don't know how to get my head around it. So I'll be very interested to see what inputs you all have. Well, from a planning board perspective, um, it seems that the scenic byway gives the planning board if if it's if it's it's done right it gives the planning board uh a little more say in how things are done in that zone uh -huh. mm. yeah uh the planning board doesn't want to uh stop somebody from developing their land if that's what they want to do they really just would like it done in a, in, a, in a good way. For example, lighting, everything nowadays, it's gotta be dark sky compliant. And, and that's, you know, that's a good idea. That's good. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, the planning board is very big on buffers. So if you got something that doesn't look so good, you really need to put up buffers, things like that. And they're into, Putting the parking lots in the back instead of right by the side of the road, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. The one oh, thing I'm going to be able to control up through there, though, is the solar part of things, right? Because you get a big project up there, that we're not going to have much say in what happens there, right? That's yeah. That's the, uh, that's the state is going to. But but having read the states. Um, plan it's I mean it's not unreasonable I mean I think they did a, a pretty good job with 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 their regulations and they do have to consider uh, town regulations as long as they're reasonable ours <laughs> <laughs> all are okay. Okay, well, um, we're probably all done then. Yes. So uh, I move that we adjourn this meeting. Oh, seconded. And thanks everybody. Everybody's here. That's great. Yeah. So. Yeah. Thanks everybody. I, I <laughs> really enjoyed the um, the Bell Station conversation. I think there's just so much. Uh, yeah, so much resourcefulness in this group. So, yeah. yes. Alrighty. Have a good okay. Meeting. Everybody, have a nice evening. Meeting.